happy Aloha Friday and welcome to a brand new episode of Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host Beatrice Cantamo. Can imaginary stories create new spaces for deeper understanding and appreciation, foster new friendships, healing and conciliation on the deep wounds caused by colonialism? Colonialism is never an easy topic to be addressed, especially when we talk about the devastating legacy and the negative impacts caused in their lives, culture, language, education, family structure, relationships, land, legal and human rights of indigenous peoples. Today's episode touches base on these topics. How do, we, uh, uh, how do current and future generations recognize and agree to continue to repair such damages? And how do people work together towards recognition and healing? What is the role and responsibilities that each government must take to facilitate this process? And how does the truth play a role in this ongoing uh, process as well? Are the effects of colonialism dominance a thing of the past or does it remain alive today? So we have the pleasure of conversing with guests Hazel Pio Hudson and Blanche Bruce Head. Blanche and Hazel are Canadian nationals and have a very special intergenerational friendship. They also have quite a story to share with our viewers. Hazel wrote The Wolf Child, a story of bravery and truth, which was selected by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And Blanche Bruce Head is an indigenous elder who attended Indian Residential School in Canada. She was quite moved by Hazel's story. And the rest of this story that you're just about to start, you'll have to stay tuned and learn all about it. On that note, welcome so much uh, to our show, Hazel and Blanche. Hello. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Absolutely. So I'm going to just start by asking Hazel, Hazel, how old are you? And uh, to go to school. How do you spend yeah, so your days? Yeah. I'm 11 years old and I am in basically a program called distance learning where I go to um, a school in McGrath for band and gym and then I learn the rest with my grandfather. Oh, lucky you to be yeah. such a special programmer and having your grandfather as your mentor. And and uh, what about you, uh, Blanche? Uh, may I ask, how do you spend your days? And uh, um, if you were not retired, uh, what would you be doing with your time? <laughs> Seriously, um, retirement just doesn't fit into my uh, into my way of life. It's um, uh, we're the type, the kind of of people that. Um, uh, we work every day, whether it's um, uh, a physical job or uh, otherwise. The nine times out of ten, we're doing mental work. We're always uh, sort of on call for people who might want to just drop in, visit, and, and uh, talk with you. Um, I, uh, since I reached seniorhood if there's if that's a word um i've noticed that uh, i'm very popular <laughs> uh, especially for people that um uh, wish to connect with the first nations people right well that's so special that uh, first nations people you know are open and uh uh, welcoming and available for this you know beautiful connection and i want to talk about uh, this beautiful connection that you and Hazel have developed. But before we do that, Hazel, I would like for you to tell our viewers about Wolf Child's story and uh, to give them a background of uh, how did you create the story and why. And uh, just to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the story in itself. Okay, so Wolf Child is about um, an 11 year old girl named Nawid Wolfchild. Um, the year is 1927 and she lives on the Blood Reserve outside of Lethbridge. Um, whenever she goes into Lethbridge to shop with her family, she faces a lot of racism and 
sometimes threats or violence. And one day, um, when her sister Miguan is hit on the head with a rock, she decides that she wants to do something about this. And so she um, be basically becomes an activist and she um, goes to um, this event for Indigenous rights and she delivers this speech, which is way out of her comfort zone. And I actually, I based her a lot, like myself, and it's shy and like an introvert and um for her this was a really big thing to do this speech but her family and um was really proud of her and she changed a lot of mindsets um in her community mm -hmm. how basically how i started it was we saw this poster in the McGrath Library, and I was like, oh, that's cool. And I love writing stories, so I was like, yeah, maybe I should do this. And um, I also based it off of it's a series of novels called Dear Canada, and it ranges from the Titanic to the Holocaust to World War One and Two to the polio epidemic, and I, I love reading those stories. Um, even though they sound a bit tragic, but um, I basically I wrote I wrote Wolf Child in like um, a journal or a diary form, and I was really excited in doing this because um, writing is just my thing, and so right. yeah. And so, what did you do with your story after you finished it? Did you share it somewhere? How did Blanche get to read about your story and learn about it? So, it was kind of funny. Anytime I made an edit on the story, I sent it out to the family, which probably I shouldn't have done. But um, <laughs> I was a little nervous about writing the story and sending it in because I don't know how it feels to be Indigenous. Like, I, I'm not really sure. Um, how it is to be in a residential school and so um my stepfather tim recommended that we see blanche roost hedge and um he knew her from the fort at lethbridge and so we met with her and um she gave me feedback and then we've been friends ever since pretty much so oh, that's lovely so you just to uh, make sure that i got this correctly so once yeah. uh, you had your final version, you submitted your uh, writings to uh, a contest or to um, a place. Um, where did you send that to? So I submitted it to um, the Truth and National Reconciliation Center and uh, we sent it off right um, at the deadline, right on the very last day of the deadline. All right. And then uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I got an email saying that it had been selected. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow, okay, I did not think that would happen. Well, congratulations. So it was selected. So what happens? What does that mean with that your uh, essay was selected? So basically, on uh, March 1st to the 3rd, I'll be in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. or, sorry, May 1st to the 3rd, um, and um, I'll be attending some leadership workshops and um, I have to give a one to two minute presentation as well. About what you wrote, right? Okay, so mm -hmm, yeah. I'm going to uh, take a quick transitional shift here to uh, get a little bit of Blanche uh, into the picture. So, uh, Blanche, uh, so when you started uh, getting the drafts of uh, Hazel's uh, uh, writings, what were your uh, thoughts? What went through your mind? Well, seriously, um, Beatrice, we just, um, Hazel and I and her grandfather and um, uh, her parents met once and she read me the story of her I, iPad and um, there's a lot of the, uh, the, the statements that she had put down were right on, they were the truth. Uh, there was just a little bit of tweaking that needed to be done and uh, um, so I didn't do very much um, in um, 
helping her with her story because she got it. 99% of, uh, of, the, of the truth about uh, the way things used to be back in, back in the day here in the southern Alberta. And uh, uh, it was just one time she read me the story and we, we kind of worked on it for about an hour, hour and a half. And uh, uh, things just started rolling from there. And then uh, about a week or so ago, she and her grandfather called me and uh, let me know that they're headed to Winnipeg, Manitoba, to the, uh, um, the, the I guess it's the uh, center where they'll be dealing with this, uh, the, the results of this contest. Like this little girl has open doors. Uh, I don't think even she totally understands between First Nations and uh, the, the rest of the world. Um, and also, um, it really gives me uh, a lot of um, pleasure to also um, let you know that the um, uh, grades, the junior high grades in Kurtzton, Alberta, are using her story as a basis of the uh, uh, the resolutions that were given by the um, uh, the commission at TRC, um, mm -hmm. uh, the thirteen um, um, resolution uh, uh, points wow. uh, that are going to be um, uh, entered into the educational curriculum here in Canada. That's really amazing. So before we talk a little bit about, and there are a lot of things you provided there, but I wanted to make sure I don't uh, miss the intention of uh, asking you as an uh, Indigenous elder who sounds like you spent uh, most of your formative years away from the First Nation and, and uh, in a school, a residential school. So for our viewers who don't understand what residential schools in Canada were like for Indigenous uh, people, would you mind giving us a little uh, uh, perspective on it? Well, to begin with, you'd be removed from your um, family. How old um, were you when that happened? Well, between the ages of three to maybe six years old, seven years old uh, at the latest, uh, you'd be removed from them and you'd be placed into a, a community where um, two or three hundred of the same age group would be in one of um, what they call um, dormitory, so, so to speak. So there was uh, junior girls and senior girls and our intermediate girls and senior girls, the same for the boys. Mm -hmm. And you'd be, you'd be in this, um, this would become your family. And most First Nations that uh, myself included that was removed from my mom and dad didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but we were not allowed to speak our language out loud during the first, probably the first two, uh, first year, second year uh, in residential school. You had to have a guardian who you would whisper everything to in your language so that you could uh, um, receive the services that they needed, such as uh, toothpaste. Um, toilet tissue, um, second uh, servings of whatever they were feeding you. All of this was, uh, and then that was why uh, most of us uh, First Nations, especially the age group that I was in um, when I first uh, was placed in residential school, um, we, um, we learned the English language really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, basically, it was a, it was a um, it was a way to survive you right. know, in the, in that in that community and uh, and you would stay in the residential school. When I first went to the school, I was there from um, the end of August to um, a week before Christmas. I was home for Christmas for. Uh, a week and then I'd be placed back at the residential school and I'd be there till Easter and then 
again uh, till the end of June. So I only went home uh, on specific holidays. Oh, my goodness. Um, but as, may, as I, uh, may I ask you all, uh, we need to take one minute break for our commercial, but we'll be right back. And uh, okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Kari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on Think Tech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show and it's streamed live on Think Tech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Kari Kunisue. Mahalo. <laughs> Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studio. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keep you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, this is your host, Beatrice Contemo, and we are back with Blanche and uh, Hazel. So, uh, Blanche, so we were talking about uh, your uh, time uh, at the uh, residential school. So, so then, uh, uh, right before we took the break, uh, you were talking about having very specific and very short periods of time uh, to be allowed to be with your family. And so, uh, okay, so you said you were learn the English very quickly in order to be able to survive and it sounds really hard that you were not able to speak your own language. Were you able to uh, practice uh, any of your indigenous traditional um, cultural values and, and anything while you were in school? No, we were um, like myself I was uh, put into a Roman Catholic Indian residential school and uh, I was immersed in that religion totally away from the mm -hmm. um, ways or, or ways of life uh, or my culture for the times that I was within that, that community. But I'm one of the fortunate ones. Um, my great grandmother, my dad, um, did not speak English so when I came when I was home, I just resorted back to being uh, Blanche the Indian girl. Mm -hmm. Oh, good for you, you know, that strong spirit, you know, and uh, a resilience that you know, came through. So, uh, so I want to talk with you both about uh, truth and reconciliation, which I know there is also, a, so there is a commission in Canada, there is also something very similar in the United States. I think in other countries too. So, um, and either one of you want to elaborate a little bit on what you think reconciliation uh, commissions do and why it was created and what does it look like in Canada? Uh, I think, well, I think re reconciliation, I think it's a lot about um, acceptance, also like apologies. Um, but I also, I kind of wanted to talk about um, some activism stuff, I guess you could say. And we will, so, we, will, we, will, we will have time for that too, but yes, go ahead. Okay, so this is a little off topic, but it'll be quick. So with women's rights and stuff, everyone is all, um, and I totally support this, but everyone says um, we need to support the woman if you see like you need to be careful in the streets if there is a man like um you need to be extremely careful because there are like men everywhere that kind of thing but i think um like women and men equality it's kind of like um residential schools and indigenous people mm -hmm. because um there's a lot of men feminists out there like i 
you know, there's my dad, my stepdad, there's my grandpa, and no one really talks about that. They talk mm-hmm. about more of the bad men, men who don't, like, support um, Women. or give women a chance kind of thing. And that's kind of like residential schools. Because mm-hmm. I've heard a couple stories where Indigenous people have actually benefited from residential schools. And I know this is really not common. Mm-hmm. But they have um, learned, um, like they enjoyed learning math and social studies and language arts and that. And they benefited from it. But no one really talks about that. And they all say, oh yeah, residential schools are very, very bad. Which I agree. They are a really big mistake. So, so, there, are, yes. so there are some oh. positives. Uh, yeah. of, of that and but there were also a lot uh, of pain that was inflicted and uh, and that's part uh, uh, of, of an injustice as well and that's why I think reconciliation through the reconcil- truth and reconciliation commissions uh, were created not only uh, to open up uh, the platform for, uh, for like yourself and the rest of the the world and the community, especially indigenous people, to be able to speak out their truth, their experiences, the good, yeah. the bad, and the ugly of uh, exactly. those experiences, and also uh, to be able to start uh, uh, sorting out, you know, w- what was really done, and and but more importantly, where do we go from here, and uh, what kind of reparations are needed, and uh, that can be done. And then once that is identified, um, you know, how do you take action as a country or as a community to make sure that that, that occurs? So uh, I, I completely uh, value your insight and, and the recognition that there was also goodness uh, and, uh, in, in that process of children going to the school and the learning process. But I want to be able to bring uh, uh, Blanche back to uh, the conversation and ask for her perspective on, uh, her, based on her own experience. What was it like for you, Blanche, in terms of if you had a choice of staying uh, and, and grow up uh, learning everything that you needed to learn in a First Nation versus being forced to go in to uh, residential school, what would you have done? <laughs> I have stayed home because uh, my people had all had lived uh, the ways that we had lived um, were in complete connection with nature. Nature was our ally. When I was placed in a residential school, um, that was deemed the ways of my people were deemed to be um, uh, based on savagery, uh, uncivilized, uneducated, uned- being educated, which was not true. Um, today, uh, looking around, I'm almost 70 years old, and I see finally the 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 the, the, the other society is now starting to understand that if they had used common sense and learned uh, from us to begin with, I think we would all be living in a very much better world, a uh, healthier world, mm-hmm. cleaner air, cleaner water, uh, the whole nine yards, because we didn't destroy. Um, we. Uh, um, you preserved the you know, great environmentalists, yes. Yeah, we were, yes, we were the, the, the what they call the uh, stewards, stewards of this land. That's why when the early Europeans showed up here, they thought it was uninhabited because we did not destroy. And uh, so uh, now they're starting to understand that, hey, connecting with nature is not a bad thing. It's mm-hmm. a very, very common sensible thing to do. Right. Well, I want to bring this back to Hazel. And Hazel, I think that part of what Blanche have said uh, would be like 
you know, going back to that part over, wouldn't it be amazing both worlds to listen to one another and figure out a way to learn uh, from each other? Imagine a school where, you know, you could learn math on science and all of the ancient and traditional wisdom of indigenous people, just of Canada, of all over the world. And that becomes part of everyone's formative uh, uh, education and the foundation to prepare them to become, uh, you know, more wholesome and balanced human beings. Which I imagine that's what you are kind of going through right now, so many yeah. generations later. <laughs> Pretty much. I think we, we would all really benefit from that. I yeah. believe that too, but the sense is math is a, a, an English word. In my language, it's simply um, uh, it's just the math, the science, the social, the uh, chemistry, the biology, all of those were in, we, we practiced them. The ancient ones practiced them, only they weren't given those names. So now the, the generations coming um, are going to get the two full um, barrels, let's put that, uh, of for, uh, natural, the nature, the world as it really should have been looked uh, after with the uh, the way the natives uh, look at things uh, through math and science, and yeah. all of that is in place. They just need to connect the, with nature, and um, they will become wiser. I'm, I'm grateful for that because I'm again in, uh, going into my 70s, so I'm really looking to the younger generations to take good care of me. Oh. Well, as it should be, and you have taken care of so many people, and you still take care of our youth in, the, in your role of so much wisdom and as an elder with so much pride and uh, so much to share. I have an invitation for both of you, which is to come back as my guest in a couple of weeks so we can give continuity to this conversation, which I think has just got to warm up. Uh, but because we are out of time, I can't believe how quickly <laughs> 30 minutes went by. But uh, I, I am so happy that we were able to get started with this conversation. And I really look forward to uh, following it and making it even deeper. And also to hear about how the story of um, Hazel you know, is going to be used in schools. Uh, in curriculum and to hear more about the actions, the 13 actions that Canada are going to be working with in that frame of reconciliation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, nice. would you please nice. come back and my guests again <laughs> so we can come out that too? I would say yeah. I would say yes too. And also with um, um, Hazel and Don going to Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, first part of May, uh, come back here and tell us what they went through in Winnipeg. Right. I would like to learn uh, more about that. Yeah. Well, that's what it's all about, the exchanges and the connections from the heart and those seeds that help us in keep back and forth. Uh, with more inquiry, more learning, more appreciation, you know, more love. I think, I think love is the secret ingredient of all of this. I love each other, love for nature, you know, love for this universe, for this earth that we have. But on that note, uh, thank you so very much for being my guest today. Thank you to our viewers for watching us. And uh, see you next time, we hope.